today could be very, very different. Today could be a family member speaking um, to create awareness around depression, suicide, um, speaking from their experience of my passing, uh, finding the writings that I would have done, which is one of the tools I used to try to manage the situation. So that, that recording was actually, it's a year ago today, so today it's the anniversary, it could be the anniversary of something worse, but it's not. RIP 1978-2014, yeah, in a sense I did die, and it's the new me in 2015. Um, and it's, it's a road I'm going to travel, it's not going to be easy, but I'm going to do it. It's going to have many challenges. So today I just want to not just create awareness, because I think there's a lot of awareness out there in relation to the issues but I want people to notice each other. So I want people to notice me because if someone didn't notice me, I wouldn't be here today. And that's the truth, okay? So life is fast. Day to day, it's fast. So we need to engage with each other. So I'm just gonna go through my presentation. I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to click in and out every so often. So this is my past, present, and now, thankfully, future journey with depression. Um, so I'm going to go through just my emotions, my feelings in the past when I was young. Looking back on it, you know, when did I notice that there was something up with me? Um, did I ever address it? Did I try to address it? Uh, the present, staying present, which is one of the, my guides to addressing my, my depression, um, and now future, so I have a future which is, which is always good. Just points to note, this is my journey. I am not an expert in the area of depression. I am not an expert in uh, mental wellness. I am an expert on me. You are an expert on you. I have a story. And the story is my life. Uh, the talk is not in general around depression uh, or mental wellness. It's about my journey. Um, I'm not here to push advice onto you. I'm here to tell my story and hopefully people can get something from it. Some will, some won't. Some will relate to it because they're going through the same thing I have. Some will know people going through the same thing I have. Um, so each person will take something from it, hopefully, today. Uh, it is about my, as I said, past, present, and now future journey. It's about me getting back to life and starting to live for the first time in a long, long time. So I'm uh, into fitness, so I usually get people to warm up. I'm, don't worry, I'm not going to get you to run around the room or anything. Um, but I'm going to get you to stand up and introduce yourself to three people you don't know. Um, so you introduced yourself to three people, that makes four people. There are a lot of statistics out there in relation to depression, suicide. One stat I heard was one in four people suffer, have suffered, or will suffer. So one of you, the four of you guys that you introduced yourself to will suffer, has suffered, or know someone that's suffering from depression. Okay, so that's how real it is. Since doing my blog, I definitely think the numbers are lower. Since all the messages I'm getting from people that I would have known since childhood, and again, I wouldn't have realized they went through the same thing, all at different levels. It's incredible. Um, so when you introduce yourself, how many of you will remember the names of the people you introduced yourself to? All the names. Hands up. Don't lie to me. <laughs> Yeah, my mother has her hand up, of course, yeah. <laughs> okay, so the thing is, the minute you introduce yourself, we forget, we don't notice, we, we, we're thinking ahead, we're moving on. So you need to stay present, you need to engage with that person, we're not noticing that person, okay? So, um, you, names you won't think of, will you uh, recognize that person again? A lot of the time we won't, we won't remember faces, 
we, could you tell me what color their eyes are? No, simple things like that. So the idea is, what I'm trying to get people to do, again, is notice me. So when you're talking to someone, engage with someone, okay? Notice that person, because you could be the person that saves that person's life without even realizing it. Um, think of all the groups you're involved in. Work colleagues, family, friends, the person sitting next to you, the person in work sitting next to you, teammates, club mates, could up to, add up to 100 people. There are a few people in those groups that are having a bad time right now. Right now. And we don't know anything about it. They'll come out smiling and inside they're dying. Okay? So we need to notice. We need to be there for a support. Um, once you're let in, you can do anything. You can change a person's life. And again, that's what happened to me. So, I, um, I've been to a lot of talks and God, can I talk? So what I want you to do is if you have questions during my talk, put up your hand and ask questions or shout it. Don't even put up your hand. Shout it out because I don't care if, if, if my presentation goes off on a tangent because this is for you to learn something from me and me to learn something from you. Okay? So question me. It is, this is the time to learn. So why did I write the blog? It's to share. It's for us all to learn. It's for you to learn that someone like me, because people have commented, you, you suffer from depression? Not a hope. Mr. Motivator, I go out and motivate everybody. I'm running the roads, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. Yeah, I suffer from depression. So if I suffer, and I'm not the only one, there's a lot of other people that are suffering too. So ask questions now because you will forget them later. Okay? So that, and if it guides the presentation, it guides the presentation. So I know I have all these clips because I, I do go off on tangents, so I need to keep myself directed. So I'm just going to say, who am I? So my name's Neil Kelders. I'm from Killarney. Oh, I'm 36 years of age. I've given it away. Um, I grew up, went to school in Balakashin. I went to school in the SEM secondary school. Um, played football, played soccer. Living across the road from a, a big GA family playing soccer wasn't the greatest idea, but you know. Um, you know, I did regular things. Um, had a laugh at the lads out in the fields playing. Teenager, experimenting, exploring, you name it. Um, Went to college in Tralee, did a sports degree, went to college in UCC, did a law degree. Could never find myself, never knew what I wanted to be. You know, still don't. It's only now I realize where I want to be and what I want to do. <coughs> um, so, you know, it's been, it's been a journey. It's been a roundabout journey. Um, I'll just put down the next clip. So this is just kind of one of my friends, actually, when I released my blog, wrote a piece. A lot of people have said posted a lot of messages to me saying, oh, you changed my life when you trained us for a marathon, you changed this, you don't realize the impact you have, and I probably didn't. So one of my friends, uh, Brian Parker, when I released the blog, I just asked him, could I use this? It was, I know Neil well for about eight to nine years and lived with him for one of those years. I would never have known, or as he would say, noticed that Neil was suffering in the way he was and is. When he told me one night earlier this year, what was really going on in his life, I was shocked and surprised, to say the least. Mostly because at any stage in my life, when times are tough, Neil was one of the first people I would have talked to, and still is. Never want to turn away from a challenge. I'm hopeful that um, the road Neil is now on uh, opens people's eyes and minds to noticing the issues people face. As Neil says, it's the noticing which is difficult, and I can vouch for that. So, yeah, I, I would have listened to people's problems, uh, chatted to people, um, and people wouldn't have realized what was going on in my life at all. Um, and that includes my family, that includes my friends, work colleagues, um, teammates, anybody. So, <coughs> um, and it came to a head in 2014 when I was noticed. So I'm, one of my things, I'm uh, uh, having fun is a big element uh, to my life now. Um, and one of the things I'm doing is acting. I have this vision of you know, Hollywood is the next, next stop for me. You know? um, so I'm uh, doing a monologue for Hamlet. Actually, Donald Courtney is from Killarney, and he's, he's doing a few sessions with me. And he, he read my blog, and he felt to be or not to be would be a good a good uh, monologue for me to do because I might get something from it. So it's to be or not to be. 
That is the question, whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against the sea of troubles and by opposing end them. To die, to sleep, no more. And by asleep we, we say to end, the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to. To die, to sleep. This was written 400 years ago, I think, by Shakespeare. And Shakespeare didn't leave, leave many interpretations for us, so we interpreted ourselves, and this is the one I go for. Hamlet is in turmoil. He's suffering from depression. That's what he's doing. He's in turmoil. He doesn't know whether to live or die. And he has many battles every day, as I did. And the words are very similar to the words I, I, I was going through in that car that day. I wanted to sleep. I just wanted no more. I wanted to, to not be here. I was just so exhausted of fighting every day. That wasn't one battle a day. It was battle after battle after battle. And a battle could be tying my shoelaces. It's just ridiculous. You know, that's where I was at. Um, you know, and it, it, it's tough. And, uh, you know, just this made me realize I'm not the first person to suffer. I, know, I won't be the last, and I'm not the only one. So that goes for all of us. But then he says, to sleep perchance to dream, I, there's the rub. And what he says here, I think, is, okay, it's tough here, but who's to say it's not going to be tough on the other side? You know, if I'm battling here, what? You know, won't I be battling? Could I be battling in death? So he says, is it better to stay here and try and get through this rather than fight demons that you don't know are on the other side? Which I think is quite interesting because for me, the light at the end of the tunnel was death. But who's to say, you know, I wouldn't have the same turmoil there in death, you know? So I think that was quite interesting. And I think it's interesting that Shakespeare was writing about this 400 years ago, so it's not a new phenomenon. So I want to open this up. I want people to shout out a few words or lines to me. What do you think depression is? Don't shout at once. Low energy. Worry? Sad. Yeah. Sad. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. We c I think we could go on and on and on. There's so many words and the thing about it, it's very individual to everybody as well and um, it's it's great being alive you know as in being a human because we are all individuals but for me then when I think about it that does create a problem when dealing with depression because we are also individual how can we address the, the issue of depression if everybody is so individual there's not one answer one not one tablet to to make everything okay <clears throat> and I'll get to that later is that it's down to the individual person to want to change. Okay? So these are a few things I looked at. Depression is, depression is many faces. And what I mean by that is we disguise it. There's, I'm outgoing, I was uh, motivational, I was this, I was that. Another person would be quiet and reserved. It has so many faces, so many masks. It's hard to tell who does or doesn't have the issue. Very individual, as I said. The way I internalize something that will happen is different to the way you will internalize it. And that's what I, f I think depression is. It's the way I internalize my head. My head. My head would see something and the way it would interpret it. Okay? It is mental and physical. So my head used to race. My head used to, I could feel a mist just covering my brain nearly. And then... I could feel my body drain, just drain. It was like as if the blood was just flowing out the bottom of my toes and crash. So it was very much mental and physical to me, and my gut would, my, would be in knots. Has no boundaries. It doesn't care who you are, what you are, where you are, and it can infiltrate us all. Okay, so we're all open to it. It's just how we deal with it is the way forward. <clears throat> it is your trigger to make a change. So when you're injured, physically injured, if you have a sore ankle, your body is telling you not to walk in your ankle. If you're low, your body is telling you something. You could be low from work, so your body is telling you that actually, you know, this work isn't suiting you in this area. You're, uh, you could be low from sport, 
that's, that particular sport is not suiting you. You need to identify what it is and make that change. Um, you know, I, I've cut back a lot in my work. I'm working in the mornings and I'm getting by and I've never been happier because I'm doing what I want. You know, and we're all caught up. We have to make money. We have to meet bills and stuff like that. But your health is your wealth at the end of the day. And it is. And <laughs> trust me, I know. It's not confined to the car. The car was, it happened to be a dark, rainy day. It's not confined to dark, rainy days. Sunny, bright days where the birds are singing, I could be just as low. It could be 5.30 in the morning, 9.30 in the morning, 10 o'clock at night. It doesn't matter. You can't outrun it. So I thought, okay, I'll move to Dublin. Maybe that's what I need. Oh, my head is still with me. My head will always be with me. You can't outrun it. The toughest thing writing this blog was, and when I released the first post, was that I was very anxious that night. I was there, oh, people are going to be talking. Oh, my God, what am I going to do? And I got really anxious. I couldn't sleep. Because for me, when I had depression, I wanted to be invisible. I wanted to walk down the street and not be seen. No one to see me, just to get to where I needed to go. And I would go down laneways. So instead of going down, usually I had to go down Grafton Street in Dublin. I wouldn't. I'd take the... the, the narrow streets, um, I drive places because you're safe in your car, you're secure. Um, when people say they go to bed, I used to close the curtains, and I love when it was dark evenings because I was in the bed under the covers, headphones on so I couldn't hear or see anything. Just a bit of music, that was me lost. And that could be me lost for three days, could be lost for a day. Um, I didn't know. The only thing is I had to get up for some work in the morning, that was the only thing that got me out of it. But there were days I called clients and told them I was sick, I couldn't come in. And that happened too. Um, not functioning. I don't think I've ever functioned, to be honest. And it's funny because people say, look, you're so progressive. You do this, you do that. I did this and that without doing anything, if that makes sense. I never followed things through. Um, because I, ha I knew it was inevitable, inevitable that I wasn't going to be here much longer, so why bother? Um, and maybe it was a lack of confidence. People think I'm confident, but inside, not so confident. So maybe that was a reason too. No sleep. <laughs> no sleep. I used to sleep 45 minutes a night. And it got to the stage where I woke up one morning and I was just shaking. I just, I, I had to do something about this. I was there, this can't go on. 45 minutes, I was there, just let me sleep. And this, this can really play on you, tiredness. So I did go to the doctors, and it was a bad period of time. And I went to the doctors, and I got some medication. I just said, I need something, please. So he gave me a tablet that I could take at night time just to get some sleep. Uh, and it was an antidepressant, but a light one, but at night time. And it just, I just needed it. Um, to medicate or not to medicate, I remember I heard Tracy Piggott on the radio, and she said, she needed it at a certain time because you can't address your issues if you're low, if you're not in a place to address it. The medication stabilized her and helped her to get to the place where she was able to address her issues. So it's an individual decision if you want to do that. I cut it out after a while and I just took it for a few months and that was it. It got, it got me through a bad period. That's what it, that's what it did. So, Racing thoughts. Um, a lot of my friends would say, geez, you've thought after thought. I used to, so I'll be in conversation with you and my head is gone already, thinking about five, 10, 15 different things. And that is so energy sapping. You could, a word could trigger it and I'll be thinking about something else, something else. But the talk could go from positive to negative in a matter of two minutes. Just so draining, thinking, thinking, thinking all the time, analyzing. Um, so I went to counseling for the first time and that met the need there. It stopped those flashing thoughts, those neg negative, um, rapid thoughts. Um, but that's all that, that counseling sessions, those, th that first bout of counseling sessions, that's all it got me. Um, and I knew that I, I had come to the end of the road with that person I needed to move on. Why am I different? Constantly asking, why, why is everybody else so happy and I'm not? And you know, why, why, why do I think I'm so bloody special? You know, why can't I just be happy with the norm like everybody else? But again, someone else next to me could be thinking the same thing. I hate myself. I just constantly hate myself being negative and thinking negative and negatively. 
and I just felt I was like a whine, and it was, I wasn't telling anybody, it was just me internally being very, very negative, and I just, I just got fed up with myself and started to hate myself that bit. Why, why, why? So it's like the kid asking, why, why, why? Always why. Why, why am I low? Why, why? And trying to analyze, get an answer for everything. What is the point? So the biggest question for me is, you know, what's the point of life? You know, we live to die. We're all going to die soon. So what's the bloody point? Is it my brother has four kids? Is that the point, having four kids? You know, is, it, is the point to work for the weekends and go out? I don't understand what the point is. You know, Oh, why do people get so much enjoyment of life? I just couldn't understand it. The point of your life is your point. The point of my life is my point. My point might be over here to do something totally different to what you want. The point of life is what you want it to be. And that's what I just recently discovered. So my, the point of my life is to have fun now. And that was a big missing in my life. So the point of your life, it's your life. It's not a dress rehearsal. You've got to do what you've got to do, and you do it now. Don't put it off in the back burner because time passes so fast, so quickly. Sometimes there are no triggers. So I was always trying to see what was the trigger, what, why am I low? Sometimes you're just low. That's it, just low. Could be no reason. There can be some reason, but you don't know. But if you try to look for a trigger, and you can't find it, you're going to drop deeper and deeper into your low. I'm alone, so I think there's an ad, and the girl says in the ad that she could be in Croke Park and she's alone, and that's the set exactly it. You know, I could be in an audience there, and I could just be so alone, and um, feeling on my own, uh, no one there for me. Yet I have family, friends, colleagues, but very, very, very much alone. Disconnected. So in my counselling sessions, I'm giving you a bit of an insight. Was that, like, I. I'm very disconnected from my feelings, so this is definitely kind of a barrier I put up and I can't connect to emotions. I haven't, I don't think I've cried in a long, long time. All I want to do is have a big cry, so if I do cry, sorry about that. But, yeah, I ha you know, I haven't cried and, you know, I hear people talking about depression, they're crying all the time, and I'm just there, dude, if I could just cry, you know, it would be some sort of relief for me. So. And I can see I'm disconnected um, from my emotions. A couple of things have happened to, to us during the years as friends and stuff, and I shut down nothing. You know, I'm just there. What is wrong with me? You know? Uh, hour long, day long, week long. How long does a low last for? I don't know. There have been days I've been in bed. Uh, for three days solid. I remember I have had a house in Milltown. My, my mom was saying she'd call out and wouldn't see me for three days. And I wouldn't answer the door, answer the phone. Like answering the phone, seeing someone's name in the phone was like nearly an invasion. They were there with you, you know, you'd hide the phone, things like that. Um, I wouldn't be seen for three days, four days, and I would eat crap. And it is a vicious circle. You eat, I'd eat 20 bags of potatoes, pizzas. Yeah, I'm a fitness guy and I'm eating crap. Um, it's just a vicious circle, and then you feel bad from eating the crap, and it's just you're going down, down, down spiral. No gray, area, gray areas, so everything was black or white. Everything, I'll save the world, or oh, I'm doomed. That was it. Bang, bang. No in between. Um, so the cycle against suicide say it's okay not to be okay, and it totally is. It, to it totally is okay not to be okay, but not for me. I was bloody sick of it. It wasn't okay not to be okay. I just wanted to be okay. Just let me be okay. That was it. I just want to be okay. So when I heard there, there, it's okay not to be okay straight away, my mind was going, well, no, no, it's not. But it is. It totally is. Of course it is. You can't be okay all the bloody time. Okay? So part of my, one of the tools I use for getting over my, trying to fool my brain to say I've addressed the situation is writing. 3rd of July, that was part, of, so my, I have loads of writings. So this is one of them I picked, uh, 3rd of July, 2014. I just, that, I dragged myself out of bed. I just wanted to go, I, I couldn't be here anymore. Can I get someone else to read? So. It is inevitable, death. No, not old age. Self-inflicted. 
overdose, hanging, jumping, crashing. That was the 8th of October 2013, so a few months apart. Can I get one more person? How can I be low? It is 5.45 a.m. How the hell is it possible? I have just got out of bed, which I have been in since 10 p.m. The day is lost. So I remember this day, 30th of September 2014, and I was, uh, so I, I train clients early in the morning, and I get it out of the way, and I could be up at half four, and I remember I was in the car, and bang, low. My body, I could just feel my body drain, my head was gone, mist, kind of this mist closing over you. I was there, how the hell, like I've been in bed. Okay, I didn't sleep, you know, too well, but I've been in bed, and it's 5.45, and I'm low. How the hell is this happening to me? What did I do? Like, what, what? And when you're low, the day is lost. It's 5.45 a.m. People aren't awake and my day is lost. Gone. Not going to function for the rest of the day. Gone. And that could lead into the next day. And my fight was not to let it lead into the next day. It's to try to, okay, be okay with it today, but not lead into the next day. But it could lead in and lead in and lead in. The day was lost at 5.45 a.m. So my journey... Um, just thinking back on my childhood, you know, I, I say 21 years, but, you know, being a child, you wouldn't really understand. So I think, I was trying to think of my childhood, and we get, I remember thinking, you know, when you're a child in school, you live for weekends and holidays. <laughs> I dreaded them, because I was alone, I could have time to think about things and do things, you know, the mind was going extra. That, that's what stands out for me in childhood, is just the weekends would really get to me. I could be alone in my thoughts. Teenager. Um, I remember watching TV3, the morning show, and there was a, uh, a man on it, and he was, I just caught the end of it, I think it was before school, and he was saying uh, he had a very successful business, he had a great loving family, he had great support, but he just was lost. He didn't know where he was. And I knew what he was talking about. And he just wondered, was anything ever going to be the ultimate? Was ever, anything ever going to, to bring peace? You know, was he going to be happy with anything? And I was, I'd say I was 15, I was there, that's exactly it. That's the first time I've heard someone speak my language. The, I remember I used to write in my science book when I used to open it. Um, Suicide, suicide, and I used to think about it and analyze it. So I was 15 years of age when I used to think about that, so it's a long time thinking. I think I sometimes, sometimes like to think I'm a little bit intelligent. Um, and in my counseling session, I realized, no, Neil, not everybody thinks about suicide. And I was there, whoa, I thought, you know, it's just a thought. You know, you know just, no, Neil, not everybody thinks about suicide. That kind of hit home as well. I was kind of, whoa. Um, and this would be a daily, daily thought. It would naturally come into my head thinking. Process. Uh, sorry, the adult. So the battle continues. Um, so one of the things uh, as an adult that came to head last year, obviously, um, I would have mini battles every day, every day, every day. So I have kind of tips and tricks I, would, I kind of learned myself to get over those little battles. Um, so one of the things was, you know, I, I think in one of my posts I, I, I say, you know, I stopped asking why and when. So why is it happening? I'm trying to analyze, I stopped trying to find the answer. I accepted it, I realized it's part of me. And I did stop trying to ask when is it going to not be a part of me. It may always be a part of me. It may stop tomorrow, it may stop in 10 years, but I stopped thinking about that and just getting on with my bloody life, you know, um, which is great. What did I do or do I do, do I do? Stop asking why and when. Accept it. If you don't accept it, you're not going to get through it, and that's the bottom line. Uh, I kind of say, you know when you, you're, you're supposed to study, when you're studying for exams, and you can get grinds, you can get books, you can get teacher support, parent support, 
But at the end of the day, none of that is any good if you don't sit down and take in the information. Same thing with depression. All the support in the world won't mean anything if you don't accept you have depression and you want to do something about it. And that's the reality of it, is that you have to want to do something about it. In a sense, you could say it's a sad fact that you have to be the instigator. You have to want to do something about it. It has to be at your core that you want to accept it and you want to make a change. Manage it, not control it. So people say, oh, can you control it? But you know, if you try to control something and you can't, you'll, you'll, feel, you'll get low because you can't control it. So you don't control it, you manage it. The lows are going to come. I accept they're going to come. I could have one tomorrow. I had one last Wednesday, and I'll explain that. But the lows, the lows will come. It's just manage it, deal with it, and be as productive on that day or active on that day as you can. That's the end. That's the end point. Um, I've written down targets, aims, and, and a word. So my word for the, this year is positivity. So everything I do, I try to think of it, and I have it written on my wall in Dublin. I've listed tar targets and aims. Simple targets and aims that are individual to you is what you should do. My targets and aims will be totally different to yours, but they guide me. They guide me to where I need to go. And they give me more uh, effect to this year and to my life. Writing I wrote, I've loads of writings, so there'll be a lot more posts coming up and I've always ideas around it. Um, but writing fooled my brain into thinking I was addressing a situation I felt it was very good. I'd pull over the car, write, and it would help a little bit. Staying present. We hear about this all the time, staying present. And if you, if you think about it, we always say the weeks are flying. Time is flying. When you're a child, it seems to go a lot slower. It goes a lot slower when you're a child because you're engaged in everything you do. You're looking at everything. You see everything. As adults, we're thinking, Ahead. You know, sometimes when you drive the car and you get to a place and you're like, how did I get here? The kid in the back seat is looking around. They know every bit of that journey. So that's why, it, you know, they're present. We're not present. We're thinking ahead. So I found, even if I thought two minutes ahead, my head was gone. I was gone. I was, there was everything happening to me. So what I'd say to people is stay present. So what I tried to do is actually, I did a 50 kilometer run there a couple of weeks ago and I wanted to stop and I started to stay present with my body and I actually started talking to myself out loud, running right, left, and it got me through over those little glitches. So that was a simple thing I would do. Make my list, so I make lists, um, what to do today, what to do in the morning, different things like that, so I would, simple things. It was broken down to simple things, it was get up, tick, and I would physically tick it off. Uh, um, unload the dishwasher, physically tick it off. Gave me a sense of achievement. I know it sounds ridiculous, but that's where I was at when I was at my lowest. Um, uh, little things like do the shopping, tick. Those three things, if I accomplish that in one day, happy days. I was productive because trust me, there were days when it was, you know, everything gets on top of you. If you don't make a list, everything's muddled and you just don't achieve anything at the end of it. Um, break down my days. So I broke down my days my weeks into days, my days into half days, my half days into quarter days, my quarter days into hours. That's where I had to be, hours. I had to break down everything. I'll do this from this time to this time, this time to this time, and start building myself up to half days, days, etc. That's That's how low and that's how needy I was and what I needed to do in order to accomplish getting through one day. Tick achievement, so as I said, I'd write the list and I wouldn't put it on my phone, I'd write it physically and I would physically take it and see it and visualize it and I have, okay, I've achieved something. As I said, doing the laundry, loading the dishwasher, things that we take for granted every day. Plan your day, week, month. Motivation is hard. So I get up in the mornings and I motivate people to get fit, lose weight, run marathons and then I couldn't do it for myself. I could tell them everything I've read books, I've read everything, I could tell them everything they need to know and I could really be passionate about motivating them and then I couldn't do a thing for myself. Um, one thing I'll say to all of us is be okay with your decision and you know what I mean by that is if you decide not to train today, be okay with that, that's fine. You don't train today, don't say, oh, or if you eat a cake, be, be okay with eating the cake. Don't think about it, you can't do anything about it after. Be okay with your decision. 
And that's one of the things I wasn't. I wasn't okay with decisions. But now I am. I make a decision, and it's a decision for me, and I'm happy with that. So be okay with your decisions. So identify. So you need to identify. So I have a few messages and stuff, and people asking me different questions. And, you know, I get low at Christmas, or I get low in February, or I get low in March. So what I would say to people is have a think, okay, if every March you get low, just try to think why. Try to identify why. And then make that little change so that why doesn't happen anymore, if that makes sense. So for me, Mondays are, as with anybody, Mondays are tough. I make Monday my busiest morning. I'm very, very busy on Monday. So that sets me for the week. I'm ready to go. I, I, I get drive from that. Whereas if I didn't, I would be sluggish. It'll take me Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday to get going. But no, bang. Monday's up early. Train clients, do work, do whatever I need to do. And that sets me up for the week. So I identified Mondays as a really sluggish, bad day for me. Try to exercise. OK, I'm a fitness trainer, fitness business, uh, motivate people. And I hear a lot of people saying that exercise is great. Uh, you know, it is great. It's good for you. It's a must. Um, looking through my writings, exercise features a lot through it that it was very important that day for me to do. <clears throat> I got to the stage where, <laughs> I, I, as I said, I had to break things down. I literally would put on my, uh, in my house, put on my running gear, and I'd just walk around the house. In it. So that was w step one. I wouldn't even go out the door for a, r a run. Just put on my gear. The next day or the day after, I'd put on my running shoes. I'd just put on your shoes. The next day, I sure would go outside. And I walked around my estate. The next day, I'd run for two minutes. And people that know me, I run a lot. Two minutes. And the next day, oh, no, I can't bang. The head is gone. I'd go back in. But I had to slowly break it down. That's how bad it was. It wasn't a matter. I've heard people say, oh, I ran miles and miles and miles. I couldn't even do that. I was that bad. I couldn't even get out of the house. You know? Um, so, but exercise, what I do is I exercise in the morning now because, again, that does set you up for the day. It's hard to get up in the mornings, but once you do it, you are set up for the day. It does, it does make a, a total difference to me anyway. Um, I've started uh, doing a bit of acting classes, and it's great fun. And uh, improvisation, improv, improv uh, is you, it's kind of comedy. You'll get a word from the audience, and you have to do the script yourself. It's all off the cuff. But one of the sayings in improv is, yes, and. So that means, so I could be upstage with, on stage with someone, and they could say they are a draft that talks and drives a car. And I have to say, yes, and. Because if I say, no, the scene is gone, the scene is dead. But if I say, yes, and, you can swim as well, the scene escalates, and everything opens up, and you have a great story. Um, and it's good fun. But it, yes, and, and that's what I try to bring into my life that yes, yes, I can do this. No doesn't feature too much. Yes, I can do this. Yes, I will do this. And it opens up a lot more possibilities for you, trust me. Give it a try. It's yes and. Don't say no. Straight away, we try to say no. Yes and. At any age, you can do anything you want. And you need to because it's not, a, as I said, it's not a dress rehearsal. It's one life. You need to do what you want to do and have fun. Fun is the major thing you need to do. Eliminate negative. So. Negative things, you know, I was training a lot of people all the hours God send, and I just, I, it wasn't what I wanted to do. I was studying for maybe my barrister exams, and I realized it wasn't what I wanted to do right now. So, and it was causing me stress, so I stopped it at that moment. I, I realized it, and I stopped it. I eliminated negative people, and people that, you know, there's always an issue, whatever, I would, if I'm listening to that, it drags you down as well. But also people that make me act negatively. They may not be negative themselves, but just I'm kind of, I see myself kind of negative around them. So I started to eliminate people like that as well. It was for me to do this. Not, not, nothing against them, but it was just for me. I needed to do this for me to survive. So if you have any questions as I'm going along. How knew you? So people have asked me, okay, how did you know you wanted to change what you wanted to do? Um, I didn't. I didn't. I, I honestly didn't. I thought, very flippant. I was there, you know, as they say, say I tried ballet. Ah, sure, it's not for me. I said, look, I tried life. I tried everything. I read. I've read so many books. I've exercised. I've done this. I've done that. Nothing's working, you know. I gave it my best shot. Time to go. See you later. That was it. I was noticed. I was in my 
sister in law brother, brother's house and just chatting and some way, as I do, I started to ramble. And my sister-in-law, basically from, you know, I was telling her how I was feeling, where I was at, and obviously it was like, whoa. So it's like someone telling you that you love very, very much, very, very close to you, that they love you and they would do anything for you but they have to go, they just can't be here anymore and you can't do anything about it. You cannot control this. They can't control this because it's inevitable, it has to be. So think about that. Think about that person you love telling you they have to go, that they can't be here anymore. You can do nothing about it. I explained it to my sister-in-law that she, they have four kids and I love those kids to bits, you know, I always have and we get on very well, we have a good good relationship and I said I love you know hanging out with them messing with them playing with them um, uh, spending time with them know that they love me and knowing that even when I'm gone they'll never see me again they'll have no need ever to say my name again to call out for me to tell me my nephew rang me on the phone to tell me about a soccer goal he scored he would never be able to do that again and um, that I will cause my mom my family so much hurt so much hurt, everlasting hurt, suffering and pain. I'm sorry, I, I still, the light at the end of that tunnel is calling me, I have to go. It's the only way. It's the only way I can rest and the only way I'll get peace. So my sister-in-law, I just can't. When I've told my family this, I can't put myself in their shoes hearing someone tell you this, that they just can't be here anymore. And our, our family's great, you know, they're very giving, they're very loving. I haven't wanted for anything, but it was my time to go. Um, so I had told my sister-in-law and she said, look, we're going to call your brother. And I said, no. So I'd gone away for a second, came back and of course he was in the house. My brother left business meetings and I was just, he's my older brother, he's 10 years older, so I look up to him. but. The emotion of just coming in and, you know, in that situation, you don't want advice, you don't want support, you, you know, you don't want, you should do this, do that, you just want. I wanted, I, I write my blog, I wanted a hug and all he did was come over and he hugged me and it was just, phew. I'm not a hugger and, you know, we wouldn't do this, but it was just, wow, it was amazing because it just 21 years fell off me, I think, you know, it was, it was the beginning of depressions strangleholds untangling a little bit I think I didn't realize it then but it was it was amazing and so we sat down we talked and he said look he rang Pierre the house on the way and I was there Man, I don't need to go to Pierre I said, oh, fine look I've chatted to you cool everything's good so but he said look will you do it I still I went to Pierre the house that day we drove and I wasn't doing it for me still it was for my family. He said, will you do it for us? If not, you know, will you do it? And I said, I'll do it for you. That's it. Because I still, you know, it was too early for me to say, yeah, I'll do it for, my, for myself. So Pied House, I was getting kind of nervous, driving up. And geez, I walked in. And I thought, like, you know, how are they, do I go in the back door? Am they going to cover my head with a jacket? You know, like, uh, you know, or so, so people won't see me or what? What? I didn't know what was going to happen. So you go and you sit down, they take your name and people are all there, do you want a cup of tea? And I said, whoa, this is, this is pretty crazy, you know? And what hit me is the amount of young people in there, teenagers, is there. That hit me, I was like, wow. You know, guys, you're only teenagers. I'm sure I was that way back then. It was, it was just, it was incredible. And everybody going through their, their, own, their own journey. It made me think as well because my depression comes from me internalizing things and seeing things differently and uh, just thinking negatively and pushing my thoughts and pushing me lower. And I, it got me thinking about bullying. I was there, like, kids in schools, you hear about bullying. It, 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 it's such a big issue because they're getting this extra pressure from someone else on top of what they're internalizing themselves. So someone else is causing that pain for them as well. And I said, geez, that's like, that's like a double whammy. I can't imagine that happening. So Pieta House, 
I had counselling, gone to counselling once before myself because I just needed to, my thoughts were rapid, it was a bad period, it was around the period I went for medication. And the, I knew the counsellor I had at that time, it was the end of the road, she wasn't doing anything else for me. She'd reached her goal as such and I could have just kept going and going and going, but it was going to be no good because of course I knew everything as well. Um, and I went to Pieta House and I got a, a, the counsellor that was assigned to me, it was a match made in heaven because she said to me, Neil, uh, which she said, you're going to be a tougher case, a tough case because you've gone through, you've done everything, you've done the exercise, you've done this, you've read the books, you think you know all the answers. And I did. I went thinking, these guys aren't going to change me at all. There's going to be nothing they can do for me. And she said, look, we're going to challenge you on a certain level. And it was what I exactly needed. I needed someone to, to put it up to me as such, yeah, very carefully, obviously, but... And she challenged me, and it was brilliant, and we explored. And when you're in counselling, everybody should get counselling, regardless, because it's talking to someone who's impartial. They're listening to you, and you actually talk yourself into your own situations, listen to your own situation. They're there to guide you. It's, 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 very, it's a must for everybody, and it's, it's very good. But um, we discussed a lot of things, and I think I confused her a lot of the times with my analysing of things. And, um, but it really worked. And what was brilliant then, she said to me, Neil, I've lost you now. So I went for so many sessions, and she goes, now I can see your, your loss. I've brought you as far as I could. She told me that, which was brilliant because she knew now it's time for someone else to take over. And it, I was just so impressed with that because she was right. I was starting to switch off in the sessions. I knew that she couldn't take me anymore, take me any further. Um, so I'm a bit of a pain that way. But uh, Pieta House just amazing work you know um didn't know anything about them i would never i would never pick up the phone or google or even contemplate thinking about going to somewhere like this not a hope in hell and i know there's loads of people in that situation as well will never do that that's why i kind of wrote the blog because i've talked to a few friends and they knew nothing about it and they were going through very bad times and all i did was share a little bit of my story and they're there what so then when I shared, they shared. So that's what the blog has done. People, I've got hundreds of messages and emails and people sharing, people I've known since childhood that I wouldn't even have known, that have gone through this at different stages in their life. Um, so that's why I'm, I'm doing the blog, is to share. It's still my journey, it's still my process. I still get my lows, but it's the sharing and realizing that we're, I'm not alone in this and other people have ideas and how they can overcome it too. <clears throat> acceptance, and I've said this already, you need to accept it. If you don't accept it, you can't move on, you can't address it. Manage it, you need to manage it. You need to find ways that are individual to you to manage it. So Wednesday, I was low. So for, for four weeks previous, I was busy, busy, busy. I was training for a 50 kilometer run. I was, uh, I started, I started. I was in a, a production in the Smock Alley Theatre in Dublin. We were rehearsing all the time, studying Spanish. I was doing, writing for the blog and I was preparing for this. So it was all, um, my days were all met morning to evening. I was on the go and I was enjoying it. It was great. And Wednesday then I was bang, low. I said, why are you low? So I stopped to think, not, not thinking too much, but I stopped thinking. I said, well, you've been out every night busy doing things and now you're not doing anything. So you're tired, you're just exhausted, and you're, you don't know what to do with yourself. And that was it, that was the low. So what I did is I got out of the house because the house was starting to close in on me and f affect me as well. So I changed my location and I went to a cafe to do some work on the laptop. Um, I did one or two things, I cleaned the house a little bit and I, I don't know, the dish laundry or something. So I made myself a little bit productive during that day. So I, I realized I was low, I understood why, and I changed my setting and moved away from it. And it helped me, it got me out because previously that could last for two, three, four days. Um, dictating the point of my life, so now I have my life in my control and I'm making, my point is gonna be what I want it to be. So, you know, I'm doing a bit of acting, doing a bit of improv and really enjoying it and I'm gonna go for a few auditions and I'm going to, you know, for me, to see, what, see where I can do and challenge myself. I've made my targets, I'm going to run ultra marathons this year, for me, because that's what I want to do. Um, 
So I'm dictating the point of my life. I realize that there are low periods around the corner that they can come at any time. I know this. I'm not going to say, oh, they're never going to come. They're not going to come. They're going to come. They're going to, I'm going to have my low periods, but I'm going to get over it. So at Christmas, I had written um, uh, a post, and I was staying in my mom's house, and uh, I got anxious, and I just told her, look, I'm, I'm quite, I need to get out of here. And I explained to her, and I just went away, and it took me a few hours to get out of it. I wrote a post on it. But I got out of that setting, uh, changed it, and I came back around after four hours. And again, if I didn't realize it, do something about it, the day was gone, the weekend was gone. Okay? So Christmas wasn't too bad because I wasn't too low at times. But I, when I was, I addressed it. Positive. Um, so coming to the end, just... Depression, am I, it has made me who I am today. It most definitely has. I wouldn't be speaking here in front of you. This is something I used to do a, a long time ago when I worked in the youth service and stuff, working with groups, and I missed it. And I, I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't have something to tell you today. So it's made me who I am. I'm a lot stronger. I'm a lot more focused. I have a future. I know where I'm going. I know where I want to go. I want to enjoy my life. <clears throat> I think I'm more understood by other, others now. Um, so they realize, you know, what I have gone through, where I was at, and now where I'm at. So people are more understanding, which is great. My family, it's brought, I think it's brought me a lot closer to my family. Um, in, in, a, in a weird way, I think maybe a little less worried about me, um, or protective maybe. Um, they know that I will, will call on them and go to them if I have an issue, which I just have to say. So, just think, your family, you don't want to burden your family with your, your experiences or your low periods. You don't want to be a drain on them. But trust me, you don't want to worry them. They, your friends or your family would rather have that worry than not have that worry and not have you around. So trust me, tell someone. Ha, give them, share that worry because they would rather that and help you address it than not have it. <clears throat> uh, friends, I've reconnected with friends from college um, uh, school, which has been great, and uh, the support they have given, which has been phenomenal. I'm achieving my targets that I've set for the year. I'm, I'm the happiest I've ever been. I'm, I'm doing things for me. I'm meeting people. I'm exploring new options, something I never really did. I realized I never really did. Um, you know, as I said at the start, Money isn't everything. We, we, we get caught up. We have to work. We have to pay bills. Yes, we do, but you know, you're going to be paying a mortgage for so long if you're stressed out because you're not going to be there to enjoy what you're paying the mortgage for, you know? Um, I'm the happiest I've ever been not making that great money, but you know, that will come around again, but I'm, I'm very, very happy. And that's where I needed to find myself and be myself and be happy first. <clears throat> Life isn't a dress rehearsal, guys. It's not a dress rehearsal. You have to enjoy it, whatever age you are. You have to enjoy it. Um, and you have to embrace it. Just with, with writing the blog, was I worried? Yeah, I talked to my family a lot about it before, you know, because it obviously impacts on them an awful lot. Before I released it, um, I was there, will I, won't I? You know, because, you know, I'm single. You know, will, I ever, will a girl ever be attracted to me, you know, hearing my story? Um, who would want to be friends with me? God, Jesus, you know, listen to him going on and on. Things like this, you know, go through your head. Um, but, and will people treat me differently? I'm the exact same person I was. I was always a messer. I'll always be a messer. I'll always have a laugh. I'll always have a smile. You just know something more about me. That's it. You just know something more about me. You know, I have something else to me. Um, so... From early morning to late night, we rush. No time to talk, no time to notice, no time to see, no time to be. So all I ask you from today is that you please notice people. Start with your family, your friends. Please notice. So I just want to, my kind of tag is notice me. So there is loads of awareness out there, but I just want you to start noticing people. You can't notice people through a text. You can't get an emotion through a text. Um, 
through Facebook. Start meeting people and, and being present with people. Because if my sister-in-law wasn't there that day, if I didn't feel comfortable with her, I would not be speaking to you today. I would not be alive. I would be dead. And that's the reality of it. It's hard words to hear, but that's the reality of it. So my blog is neilkelders.com, and you can follow it, and it sends you an email when I update it, and it's anonymous. And the goal is to share it with people. Share, 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 share. Because that's the only way we're going to learn, and we're going to be able to deal with these situations, is learning from people like me. Sorry, People like me. That's the only way. We need to learn. You need to ask me questions, because that's the only way you're going to get the information you need. All right? Share, learn, ask questions, notice people, notice me. So I'd like to thank you very much for listening to, to my story. And if anybody has any questions, uh, even if you want to come up to me after, that's, that's great. I appreciate it. Thank